getting married is a big adjustment from being independent to sharing everything. Our space, our things, our lives. And this can cause a lot of conflict, especially when we're first married. Inevitably, we'll have different tastes in certain areas. The pictures we choose to have on the wall, or our music collection, or our wardrobe. Whatever the issue, conflict is normal as we discover and adjust to our differences. Sura and I, like every couple, have our share of conflict, some of it over really small issues. When we first got married, Scylla didn't like my favourite pair of shorts, so she hid them. I was really annoyed and quite upset. And then, after she'd finally relented, some weeks later, she told me she couldn't remember where she'd hidden them. I have forgiven her, although I'm still holding on to the faint hope that they'll turn up even though it was 40 years ago and we've moved house four times since then. One of the things for me about sharing my space is that I find I can far too easily blame Nikki for the things that go wrong in my life. Now, not long ago, it was pouring with rain and I was about to set off on my bicycle and I couldn't find my waterproof trousers. As Nikki had already left the house, I immediately assumed that he had taken them and started to feel really cross with him. But then, after looking a bit harder, I discovered he had very kindly folded them up after the last time we'd used them and put them away. So I realized again how easy it is for us to blame each other when things go wrong. A major reason for the breakdown of couple relationships today is that when a couple hits conflict, they think, oh no, I've married the wrong person. I've made the wrong choice of partner. And that's a message that the media and popular culture tends to perpetuate. If a relationship is right, you won't have any conflict. But that's a myth. Conflict is inevitable in every relationship. That's partially because we're all naturally self-centered to a greater or lesser degree. We'd probably all admit that it's much easier to focus on our own desires, our own opinions, our own needs, than on those of our partner. My name is Sally. I originally come from Egypt. I'm Sami. My family, we are originally Egyptians. Uh, we were living in Sudan. I've met Sami when I was 14 and he was a bit older. She was so attracting her personality in terms of uh, just being herself, simple, not complicated, which I like that okay. from day one. <laughs> <laughs> we were arguing a lot in the first year of marriage and it was about the little things and the big things. When we got married, we moved together. So uh, we coming from a culture that we stay in our parents' home till we get married. That's, that's how it goes. My mom, bless her, she was like taking care of all the things that needs to be done. But uh, when we got married, I, I, I found different lives. I need to uh, wash dishes. I need to put my... Uh, Thank you, Claire. Yeah, <laughs> or uh, all those simple things that some of the conflicts were, were around habits as well, like watching TV in the morning, for example, or uh, at night before we sleep. Yeah, I love TV. And I had to change a lot because Sally does not, doesn't like that. And we need to the point that, okay, what should I do? So do we have a, a fight every day <laughs> or just leave the TV? Well, we managed after making an agreement that we will never have a TV in a bedroom <laughs> yeah, again, yeah, ever, yeah. ever, ever. But remember, first in our first uh, few years, four years of of our, of our marriage, we had a TV. Yeah, in that's our why bed. we were yeah, fighting yeah, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I can't change Sally, and I believe she reached the point that she can change me. But we can um, accept each other with the way we think. We also experience conflict because we're different. No couple will agree on everything. We're all individuals and we come into marriage from different backgrounds, with different desires, different personalities, different priorities, and we're different as men and women. And actually, arguments aren't altogether a bad thing because burying feelings of annoyance and hurt is unhealthy and doesn't resolve anything. Professor John Gottman, a psychologist who's been analyzing the habits of married couples for over 40 years said, fighting 
when it airs grievances and complaints, can be one of the healthiest things a couple can do for their relationship. The issue isn't whether we'll disagree. The issue is how we deal with those disagreements. And the really important thing for every couple is to have the tools to resolve conflict constructively. The first requirement, if we're to resolve conflict in a healthy way, is being able to manage our anger. We want to be clear, anger isn't wrong in itself. In fact, it's part of our God-given makeup. It's what we feel when something is wrong, when something needs to be sorted out, when we or someone else have been unjustly treated or hurt or offended. And that adrenaline rush that we feel when we get angry is designed to get us to do something about the situation. But anger can be used wrongly in a number of different ways. And we use two animals to illustrate two inappropriate and unhelpful ways of managing our anger. Some people, when they get angry, let you know about it right away. We call them the rhinos, because if you provoke a rhino, it's quite likely to put down its head and charge you. When I was a student, I spent five months backpacking across Africa. On one occasion, together with eight other backpackers, we hired a driver called Joseph to take us in his Land Rover into the nearby game park. 20 minutes after arriving there, Joseph spotted a rhino sitting in the shade of an acacia. We swerved off the road and drove up extremely close so we could take some photos. Joseph reassured us that if the rhino decided to charge at us, he could drive away much faster. Quite quickly, it became apparent that the rhino was not as pleased as we were about us being so close. Sure enough, this massive beast lumbered to its feet, lowered its head and started to charge at our Land Rover. Joseph duly accelerated away and, true to his word, we easily outpaced the rhino. That is, until a minute or so later, the Land Rover ran out of fuel. We rolled to a halt and turned as one to see the rhino charging at speed in a cloud of dust. Mercifully, it stopped in its tracks just short of us and then stood there snorting and shaking its head angrily, clearly trying to get us to move again. We sat frozen in our seats for what seemed like an eternity. Eventually, much to our collective relief, the rhino turned and trotted away about 50 metres, only to turn back and charge at us all over again. Eventually, after four hours of these mock charges, it started to get dark. The rhino, by now tired or bored or both, trotted off into the sunset. But once it had gone, Joseph himself trotted off in the opposite direction to get some more fuel, leaving the nine of us in his Land Rover. We had some great photos, but we were nervous wrecks. Some people act like that rhino when they're upset. Other people tend to hide their anger. When they're angry, they become quieter and may withdraw. We call them the hedgehogs, because when a hedgehog is threatened, it curls itself up into a ball and sticks out its prickles to keep whatever is threatening it at a distance. Now, it's not that the hedgehogs don't feel anger. It's just that they display it very differently. They may withhold affection or become sarcastic or suddenly develop very selective hearing towards their partner. And people who behave like hedgehogs might think, I don't want to deal with this or if I don't do anything about it, it will go away. But in reality, the anger doesn't go away. Rather, it's buried. And when they can't hold any more anger inside them, they're liable to explode in one way or another. Both rhinos and hedgehogs have to learn to manage their anger appropriately. If you know that, that you have an anger problem, don't be ashamed to seek help. The fact that anger management is a thing means that you're not the only person who feels that way. When anger goes wrong, it, it can go wrong in lots of different ways, but I, I guess the, the two main ways are, firstly, we start feeling angry and then our anger just escalates, which sadly for some people that leads to physical abusiveness, it can lead to property damage, it can lead to verbal insults. Rageful anger effectively loses sight of the purpose of anger. Rather than trying to make contact with the person, it just sort of drives through them like a bulldozer or a rhino. And in withdrawal anger, in that sort of hedgehog state of anger, it means that that sort of anger that's designed to do something short term ends up living long term. So we end up in a situation where we remain hostile, we remain in conflict with somebody way after the thing that caused the conflict has passed. It's sometimes worth 
thinking a bit deeper about it as well. Because often behind our anger will be other emotions. So I quite often find that some people who get angry quite easily sometimes do so because they're skipping another emotion. So maybe actually really they feel scared, but they feel safer being angry. Or, or maybe that they're disappointed or sad, um, but you feel more powerful if you're angry. Ultimately, our really deep relationships are built on vulnerability. So we go for anger because we think that's safe. It's domineering, it's commanding, it's aggressive. But actually we're in a much safer place when we say, I'm scared, I'm sad, I'm stressed. And it's in those moments when we soften and the person we're married to softens with us that the background of our relationship is built. That's the foundation. When I'm angry, I shut down, walk away. <laughs> I just like, let me just be alone. But it's not fair to my wife to do that. He loves to, like, he'll go, he'll leave, and he'll hum to himself, or he'll go watch television, you know, like it, like it never even happened, which, of course, would drive me up the wall. When I would get angry, I would give him the silent treatment, the classic silent treatment, so I wouldn't speak, I wouldn't say anything, he'd go, what's wrong? And I'm like, nothing. And we had to learn, like he said earlier, it's like, you just gotta quit, you know, grow up. You have to talk about stuff and you have to acknowledge that in truth, the problem is not that you're like mad. The problem is you're hurt about something, you're frustrated with something, you're scared about something and your anger is just the way it's showing itself. So you gotta talk about what's underneath all that of just communicating and, and being authentic and real in the way you're communicating with your spouse because it's just not gonna work any other way. In the early days, I was definitely a rhino. Oh my goodness. And he was definitely a hedgehog. But then he wouldn't realize I was angry and he wouldn't realize I was actually exercising my rhino-ness. And then I would probably let slip a really non-PC word and he would go, oh, are you angry? Which would make me even more of a rhino. I would really be charging at that point. But you know, over the years, like I said, we've learned how to deal with each other. So now when he says that, oh, were you really, are you, are you angry? I normally just laugh. It just diffuses everything. It, it was actually really useful learning all these terminologies so early in our marriage. So we could work on it and not become, and, and, and not let it become such a big deal over mm. the years. So yeah. he's become much better at, I think, saying something early before the hedgehog tendency appears. And I'm better at not being a rhino straight away. I will actually take a step back first before I charge and think, wait a minute, does, do I actually need to even bring this up? Because sometimes it's just us, right? It's, it's stuff that goes on in our heads and then we want to attack someone for it. And sometimes I need to just tell myself that, wait a minute, you know, he doesn't need to, be, to bear the brunt of that because it's just you. And yeah, that's helped a lot. You may have guessed by now that I'm very much at the rhino end of the spectrum. And I have more hedgehog tendencies. And being charged by that rhino and surviving was better preparation for marriage than I could possibly have imagined at the time. Being different is fine. We just have to be aware of our own tendency and learn to manage the way we display our anger. Actually, as we'll see later, rhinos and hedgehogs can learn to air disagreements in a constructive way without hurting each other in the process. We want you to turn to the first conversation in your journal, Rhinos and Hedgehogs, and ask yourself, which way do I have a tendency to go? And in case you're not sure, you might want to check with your partner who may have a better idea. The second requirement to resolve conflict effectively is to recognize and accept the many differences between us. Some of those differences are to do with our personalities that can cause tension and possibly conflict in our relationship. One difference might be one of you is more cautious. You take a long time to make decisions, while the other is more impulsive. You make decisions more quickly and easily. And as we go through this list, you'll recognize that each of you will be at a different point on the line between the two extremes. 
One of you may be highly organized and make plans well in advance, while the other prefers to go with the flow. You like to keep your options open in case you find a better alternative or perhaps a cheaper deal. Another difference between you may be that one of you likes to take the lead, to be in charge and to initiate change, while the other one prefers to support. You really enjoy helping your partner to fulfill their goals. One of you may be more extroverted. You're restored and reinvigorated through spending time with other people. While the other is more introverted, you restore your energy through spending time alone. And one personality preference isn't better or worse than the other. It's just different. And we can't expect to change our partner to be like us. I cannot say no. And he very rarely says yes. I like the spontaneous and the surprise kind of things in life probably a little bit more than you do. You like an organized sort of surprise, don't yeah. you? Like, <laughs> what time are you going to surprise me? Where do we need to be and what are we going to do? Yeah, basically, uh, a bit like that. I'm the type of an individual that makes a plan and as a result of making the plan, I want to stick to the plan. In her case, I think she's much more free. So rather than following the plan, she would <laughs> suddenly have a great idea and I had to adjust and it was it got to be kind of wild at times. I attack things head on and I want things done yesterday. And I kind of like go slow on things. Kate will start telling a story and she will tell it with a lot of feeling. So there's a <laughs> lot of feeling but none of the facts. We've had arguments in the past where Dan's gone no and then corrected the facts, but actually it wasn't no, it was that it was eight o'clock, not five o'clock, and that it was four people, difference. not three people. Quite a big difference. Which is how you feel, but I'm like, no, the emotion was true of the moment. <laughs> and whereas you'll tell a story and there won't be much emotion and it'll feel like the story was wrong. I don't need all the details, just give me the goal of what needs to be right. done. Right. And I just begin to figure out how to knock down every obstacle there is. I'm an A to Z person, he can enter in at M and make it happen. While these differences between us can cause some tension, actually they are also a good thing, as it's through our differences that we complement each other and can grow into being a great partnership. There are two areas where Silla's and my own personality preferences have provoked significant conflict for us, as they have for many couples. Managing our time and managing our money with timekeeping, we're very different, particularly when it comes to the amount of time we each like to allow when we're going on a journey. So I like to allow masses of time. I am very happy at stations or airports, having a cup of coffee, buying a magazine and watching people. It makes the journey so much more fun. Whereas I think it's a complete waste of time to get there any earlier than we strictly need to, when I could be using the time so much more productively at home. So we've had to find a compromise and meet somewhere in the middle. With regard to money, I think our different attitudes have a lot to do with our personalities, although our parents probably help to shape our views as well. By and large, there are three choices we can make with our money. We can save it, we can spend it, or we can give it away. Now, I'd say that Nikki and I have always agreed on how much, when, and to whom we should give money away. But with the other two options, we are poles apart. I think I'd describe myself more as a natural saver, while Scylla's more of a natural spender. Now, that I don't mean in any way she's a compulsive shopper, nor does she particularly enjoy shopping any more than I do. What I mean is, she finds it easier to spend money than I do. In fact, a lot easier. So, when we were first married, we'd almost always be overdrawn at the end of each month. Now, because of Nicky's saving tendencies, he had usually put enough aside to pay it off. But every month, I ended up feeling guilty for overspending, and Nicky, not surprisingly, felt resentful about it. And at that stage, we both thought that I was better with money than Scylla. And it was only after a number of years of marriage and quite a lot of conflict that it all came to a head and we had a really big argument about money. Then when we'd finally calmed down, we had a long discussion and it suddenly occurred to me that I'm not better with money than Scylla. In one sense, Scylla's much better with money than I am. She's incredibly generous and really good at working out what's needed each week, as well as buying occasional treats and surprises for the family and presents for other people. Now, it was at that point that we both realized we were better at different things. 
Nikki is better at managing money, and I suppose I'm better at using money. And that's when we began to realize that we could help each other and that our differences are complementary rather than an inevitable source of conflict. And I can honestly say that since then, I've not felt any resentment of the way that Scylla spends money more easily than I do. Rather, I've come to appreciate what Scylla's good at, and we've recognized how we can help each other. And Scylla certainly helps me not to be overcautious and to be a lot more free with money. And Nikki has taught me to be better at budgeting and keeping account. Knowing I can talk to him and ask for his help means I don't bury my head in the sand anymore. So, whether it's to do with money or traveling or some other area of life, there'll be strengths and weaknesses to our different preferences. By recognizing and accepting these differences, we can learn to appreciate each other's strengths and support each other's weaknesses. In that way, we can work together effectively as a team. We want you to turn now to the conversation in your journal, recognizing your differences. First, mark against each issue where on the line you think your own and your partner's preferences lie. In the examples you'll see on the issue of money, Scylla's closer to the spending end while I'm further towards saving. Now, each of you put your own and your partner's initials on the line between the two extremes. Then, once you've done that, exchange your journals and compare what you've each put. Then discuss how you can complement each other with at least one of your differences. So to resolve conflict effectively, we must learn to manage our anger, recognize and accept our differences, and look for solutions together. People deal with conflict in different ways. When we're under pressure, we so easily revert to the behavior that we learned when we were growing up. For some people, that means going on the attack, like the rhino. That's when we try to force our partner to do things our way. Other people surrender, a bit like the hedgehog, we may be frightened of conflict, we may hide, run away, or do anything to avoid confrontation. Still other people bargain, which is when we say, I'll do this if you do that. Now, this way sounds great in theory, but in practice we end up saying, I'm not going to do my bit because you haven't done your bit. And none of these really helps us to sort out the problem. The effective way is to look for a solution to the problem together. And that requires a shift in thinking to see that we're on the same side, not opposite sides. Then discussing the issue together and looking for a solution that works for us. We all need to find us solutions. My name is Tulu Dubemi. I worked in the oil industry in Nigeria and her cousin's husband was one of my workmates and we got on really well. He says to me, his wife's cousin, he thinks would be brilliant for me. And I gave in to him and said, all right, fine. I will take her number, give me her number, I will call. And what I thought would be a two, three minute conversation turned into a two hour conversation. And um, a month later, I asked her to marry me. Over Skype? Yeah. We had it, not it met. Was, and I said, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Just after we got married, we had a lot more conflicts. We had, there weren't big conflicts, but they occurred a lot more. And it usually started with one thing leading to another, leading to another because of poor responses on our part. Tolu likes to be busy when we're talking <laughs> about stuff. And I usually have to kind of say, all right, come on, let's sit next to each other. Because then it's not a battlefield. It's not you against me. Mm -hmm. It's actually, we're just going to sit together and deal with this issue that's, that's in front of us. Because when you're holding on to somebody, right, it's very hard to feel like you're fighting them. It's like, oh, we're having a conversation. We're navigating this thing together, and we're just going to find our way through it and come, come to an end, and both of us will win. That process of resolving that conflict, that was the essential thing to 
having a happy relationship. Instead of sweeping the, the issue under the carpet, we actually address it. We come up with a solution that's suitable and mm -hmm. that we are both happy about. When conflict arises, I think we'd all recognize that there are bad times to try and resolve arguments. At these times, we have to learn to press an imaginary pause button and wait for a better moment to discuss the issue. One bad time is when we're in front of other people. As the saying goes, don't air your dirty laundry in public. Other times we need to hit the pause button are when we're about to leave for work in the morning or when we've just got in from work in the evening. There's one, though, that's especially common, and that's late in the evening, when we're likely to be tired. And that was certainly the case for Nikki and me. In the early days of our marriage, we recognised that our most futile arguments were always late at night. We have some friends who were married two weeks before us, and I remember them telling us a great tip that they had learned early on in their marriage, which they called the 10 o'clock rule. They explained that if they were having an argument and it was in the evening and it was after 10 p.m., either one of them could call the 10 o'clock rule into play. And that meant they had to press the pause button, however difficult that was, and any further discussion around the topic causing the argument had to be postponed until a better time, perhaps earlier the following evening or at the weekend. And we've used the 10 o'clock rule many times since then. And it means saying, we're not making any progress. I'm exhausted and I don't trust myself not to say something hurtful that I'll regret. So it's safer not to say anything and to come back to this conversation at a better moment. The 10 o'clock rule certainly takes self-discipline, but then self-discipline is a big part of resolving conflict. If you're a rhino like me and you find yourself losing control, or if the conflict is escalating into a shouting match, Hitting the pause button at any time of the day might mean stopping for 15 or 20 minutes in order to cool down. Perhaps going into a different room or outside and just taking some deep breaths. Another time to hit the pause button is when conflict happens in the wrong place. We have some friends who were living in a very small apartment in their first year of marriage and used to argue a lot. Then one day, quite by accident, they discovered that going for a walk together in their nearby park and being side by side rather than face to face really helped them discuss the issue causing the conflict much more rationally and calmly. So from then on, they decided they would make their apartment a conflict-free zone by pressing the pause button and going for a walk if an argument started. We want to run through five very practical steps that help us to find a solution together when we have a disagreement. The first step is focus on the issue that's causing the conflict. Again and again, couples say to us that their arguments get widened and sometimes they can't remember what it was they were arguing about in the first place. Identifying and focusing on the issue is often the most important part of preventing conflicts escalating. We find it helpful to imagine we're on a three-seater sofa and we're at either end of the sofa with this issue between us, separating us, stopping us hearing each other or seeing each other's point of view. What we need to do is focus on the issue that's come between us, put it out in front of us and then move towards each other on the sofa with nothing between us and focus on the issue that's now out in front of us rather than attacking each other. And when we do that, we find the issue itself becomes smaller and more manageable. The second step is use I statements. I remember the person who married us giving us a very helpful tip. He said there are two phrases to avoid at all costs in your marriage. You always and you never. Because when we use these phrases, we're attacking and labeling each other's character. A much more productive way, rather than accusing our partner with you did this or you did that, is to use I statements and to talk about our own feelings. That opens the way for positive discussion. So instead of you never come home at the time you say you're going to, it's much more helpful to say, I feel hurt when you don't come home at the time you say you will. And instead of you always leave your clothes all over the floor, it's better to say something like, I feel upset by the mess in our bedroom. And I know that when I'm upset, rather than accusing and labeling Nikki, 
talking about how I feel about the issue is much more conducive to us finding a solution. The third step is listen to each other. Before trying to find a solution, we need first to try to understand each other's perspective. And making sure we listen will be especially important if we know we're better with words than our partner. Usually when we're having an argument, we're very keen that our partner understands our point of view, but we're not quite so keen to understand theirs. So a simple but very effective ground rule is this, take it in turns to talk. And when it's our turn to listen, it's a good idea not to spend the time thinking about what we're going to say next. The fourth step is brainstorm possible solutions. Now, that may sound unrealistic in the middle of a heated discussion, but if we followed the first three steps, this becomes possible. Start to talk together about different possibilities. And it sometimes helps to write down possible solutions, particularly if it's a really big issue that's been unresolved for some time. The fifth and final step for resolving conflict is choose the best solution for now and review later. If the solution works, the issue will stop causing conflict. If it doesn't work, we can go back to the other solutions we came up with until we find one that does. And it's a liberating attitude when we both accept the solution we try doesn't have to be set in stone. That takes the pressure off. And there may be times when we can't work things out on our own as a couple. And it can be very helpful to talk to someone else. That may be a friend, or if you're engaged, the person who's marrying you, or a counsellor. We want you to turn now to the next conversation in your journal called Using the Five Steps. Discuss the questions there and be sure to talk about whether those five steps are different to the ways of approaching conflict you saw in your parents' relationship or whoever was the main role model of marriage for you growing up. I think it's important to say sorry because it uh, kind of evens the playing field. You never say sorry. Maybe the next yeah. week she will say. <laughs> I haven't heard you say sorry about anything. Have I had to say sorry about anything? It's very hard for me to say it until when I do, it's because I actually do mean it. This is a trap. There's no way to make this sound like I'm not being defensive about a thing. I will say sorry if I need to. He needs to sulk before he can say yes. sorry. I have to process, not sulk. I think it's a bit simple to say that sorry leads to forgiveness, but I think it's a good start. You have to have let the other person know that you hear them, and if you've stepped out of line, then you need to apologize for it. If you're married, you should forgive. That's one of the rules. You vow to forgive. Yes. You vow to forgive. If you don't forgive, you can move on. If you know that you have done something to hurt someone, the one person in this entire universe who really loves you, Come on, men, say sorry. As we said at the beginning of this session, it's inevitable that there'll be disagreements in a marriage. And it's also inevitable that at times we'll hurt each other, though usually it won't be deliberate, and often we'll be unaware that we've done so. But that hurt must be healed if our marriage is to flourish. So we want to talk about a simple but powerful process for healing hurt, of course, there are different levels of hurt, and the bigger the hurt, the longer it takes for healing to come and for trust to grow again. But we've seen this process bring healing for very big hurts as well as small ones. It's a simple process, but it is challenging. There are three parts to it. Talk about the hurt, say I'm sorry where we need to, and forgive. So first of all, talk about the hurt. When we've been hurt, we need to tell our partner rather than allow it to fester inside us. Now, at the beginning of our marriage, when I felt upset or hurt, holding on to negative emotions was definitely an issue for me. So when I was upset by something that Nikki had said or done or not done, then rather than talk about it, I would just go silent and go into a sulk. If he asked me what the matter was, I would say nothing, and allow resentment and self-pity to take over. And then I'd be in a bad mood. 
and sometimes for quite a long time, perhaps an hour or two, or even a day or two. Now, obviously, that was really not nice for Nikki, and it had a very negative impact on our relationship. Gradually, I realized I had to change that behavior. I had to learn to open up and tell Nikki why I was upset, rather than letting the resentment build. And I found that very difficult. I think partly because I hadn't seen it modeled when I was growing up. So opening up for me meant letting go of the negative emotions, letting go of the resentment and my pride, not nursing the self-pity, and then trusting that Nikki was going to listen to me. Now, as I started to do that, I realized that talking about the problem with Nikki made things better, not worse. Meanwhile, whereas I could always tell if Scylla was upset, even if I didn't know why, I tend to hide my feelings, and Scylla normally doesn't have a clue that I am upset about something she's said or done. As a hedgehog, it takes real courage for me to tell Scylla about it. The problem with holding on to hurt and negative emotions is that it can be stored up and left unresolved for hours, days, months, or even years, and this will spoil our intimacy. Some great friends of ours in the first few years of their marriage would ask each other every week, is there anything you need to forgive me for, so that hurts weren't left unaddressed? So the first part is talk about the hurt. And the second part of the process is learning to say sorry. And in marriage, we'll have to say sorry often. You know, Dan and I have been married a long time and um, we've written books on marriage and so forth. And, but I think sometimes we still find it hard to say sorry. When we first got married, somebody gave us that lovely verse from the Bible, uh, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Someone's paraphrased it, resolve the flack before you hit the sack. But sometimes we go to bed not having said sorry and we'll be puffing and puffing and pulling the sheets and normally one of us will decide to go for reconciliation. I might decide to try to touch Diane's leg with my big toe. Dan will withdraw the whole leg. <laughs> but we've learned over the years it's important to say sorry. Sometimes, you know, when we say sorry, we're not saying sorry for the whole thing. We're saying, darling, I take responsibility for my part in this. And I'm always staggered at the sheer power of that word sorry. Sometimes Dan and I have driven for 50 or even 100 miles in silence in a car and, and then one of us has the courage to say, well I'm sorry darling, I, I, it wasn't all your fault and boy that, that releases the tension and allows us to, to, to begin that reconciliation. And you know the funny thing about arguments, if you learn to resolve them, if you can say sorry sincerely, and it is important, I think, it is sincere, and it's not just one person always saying sorry. If you can do it, normally a couple of days later, you can't even remember what the argument was about, and you move on. Sorry, I think, is a very, very powerful word uh, in a marriage. The third part of the process is to forgive. Every marriage needs forgiveness at its heart. Forgiveness is the greatest force for healing in a relationship, but sometimes it's so hard to forgive. Forgiveness means facing up to what has hurt or upset us and then choosing not to hold that thing against our partner. Forgiveness is a choice we make regardless of our feelings. And I certainly needed to learn that early on in our marriage. When I set out on marriage, I thought that our love for each other would automatically resolve any conflict or any hurt between us. I couldn't imagine that we'd need to say sorry and forgive each other. We were in love. However, I still remember vividly a time about a year into our marriage when we had a really heated argument about money. And Nikki said something that really upset and hurt me. I, I didn't feel he'd understood my point of view and I felt accused. Well, it was the Friday of a special weekend that we had been planning for ages when we were gonna go away. And I didn't want it to be spoiled. So I tried to pretend that everything was fine, but clearly it wasn't. I was feeling more and more resentful and full of self-pity. And it was one of those occasions when each time I asked Scylla, what's the matter? She would say nothing. Until about 24 hours later, when she did manage to pour it all out to me. And when I understood why she felt so upset by what I'd said, I was able to say sorry for hurting her like that. And I think I then realized for the first time that I had a choice to make, either to forgive Nikki or to go on being full of resentment. 
and allow it to spoil our relationship. And I realized that meant I had to forgive him out loud. And I found that incredibly difficult. And I think I said, I forgive you through gritted teeth. But the amazing thing was, once I'd said it, I felt completely different. The resentment went, and I found I wasn't nursing the self-pity anymore. That was the first time when we consciously used this process. And we both remember that moment so well. The tension between us left, and we found on the journey home, we were able to discuss the issue that had caused the hurt in a new way. And I also learned not only did I have to be more open with Nikki and tell him why I felt hurt, rather than simply holding on to the negative emotion, but I then had to choose to forgive him and not let my pride get in the way. And I now know it's better to do that a lot sooner than I did then. So, to sum up, forgiveness is not pretending that the hurt doesn't matter, denying it or burying it and hoping it'll go away. Forgiveness isn't easy. It's hard to forgive because we have to give up something of our sense of justice and what we regard as our rights. We have to give up our self-pity. And it helps to recognize that forgiveness is something we choose to do as an act of our will, even though we may still feel the anger, the hurt and the resentment. When we've been hurt deeply, forgiveness has to be a process. We have to go on forgiving every time the hurt comes back, sometimes on a daily basis. And as we do so, the memories will have less and less power over us. My name is Josiah. And my name's Heather. Our families, we go to family camp at the same place every summer. And that's kind of when we started dating. And well, you know, the rest is history. I think forgiveness is like, is a bedrock to a relationship. Yep. Um, if you don't have forgiveness, then it just breeds bitterness, mm -hmm. which takes up a lot of space in your heart and a lot of space in your mind. The first couple years into our marriage, Josiah came, was picking me up from the airport and he just came out and told me that he had had a porn addiction. We had a two and a half hour drive home and I knew that I needed to tell her about it. And so we're locked in a car and there's no escape from, from that conversation. So, um, I confessed that to her and that was a long journey of forgiveness, I think for her, which you can talk more about. I could see how sincere he was and like, and convicted and how much pain and shame that he was carrying. So it was quick in that moment for me to recognize um, his hurt. But then, you know, hours later, like my hurt and my pain um, and that like violation of trust happened. And so, it was probably over the next year it really took me to really fully forgive that because it's easy to hold on to the things um, that someone has done and even just use them as a point of like, well, you did this to me. Um, and so that journey in forgiveness was just me having to let go and just say, um, again, like, this isn't about me. It's about what's happening in Josiah's heart. And so by me forgiving him, it like released him. And, mm -hmm. and released myself too, into a greater amount of freedom. Um, and it didn't take up the space in my, in my head, in my heart. It's not just a like one and done thing. There's always, like it's a journey that you can, and you continually to choose in that, choose into that. It's not a cool, done, got, got past that forgiveness hurdle. Um, continually choosing into that. And uh, for both of us, for it, regardless of it's something really big or something really small it makes you more intimate because you've like shared the darkest parts of your heart and the darkest part of your life and your fears. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a weird way, like we've been more intimate now and been able to be more honest with each other from, yeah, from that. Definitely. The Christian understanding of forgiveness is that just as God has forgiven us freely, we must forgive each other freely. I find it helpful to think of forgiveness flowing into my life from God and then out of my life to those around me, especially the closest person of all to Nikki. There are times when that's been hard and I've had to ask for God's help to be willing to forgive and to let go of resentment and hurt. But we can honestly say that going through this process together of saying sorry to each other and forgiving each other brings a great sense of closeness and intimacy. And we've experienced that many times over the years. The next conversation in your journal is called Healing Hurt. The aim is to identify any hurt between you that's still unresolved. 
and it'll help you understand how and why your partner feels hurt, which is an essential part of the healing process. Now, we recognize that this is the hardest conversation for many couples, but the most important for some of you. As where there's unhealed hurt and buried anger in a relationship, it will ultimately cause a loss of closeness and connection. And you may need to take more time over the coming week to address these issues. And if during that time you get stuck as a couple, please ask for help. When we heal the ways we've hurt each other through bringing it out into the open, saying sorry and forgiving each other where we need to, we wipe the slate clean. Then we can start each new day with nothing from the past that could cause resentment, and love is able to flourish between us. The continuing conversation after this session is an opportunity to use those five steps for resolving an area of conflict. Try them out and see if you can come up with a new solution for an issue that you've been struggling with. We're going to finish with another of those passages from the Bible we've put in the back of the journal that you might choose if you're planning your wedding. This is perhaps the best known of them all. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's a beautiful description both of God's love for us and what it means for us to love each other. It includes a phrase that Nikki and I come back to often. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I'd like to say a prayer for you to experience that flow of forgiveness that I talked about earlier in your own relationship. So please stay as you are while I pray. Thank you, Lord, that you are so patient and so kind towards us. Thank you that you forgive us. And we pray that you'd help us to keep forgiving our partner as we seek to heal the ways that we've hurt each other. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us again. And we look forward to you being with us on the next session. SCO8, take five. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I'm sorry, we need to finish this. I do love my wife's body <laughs> and the weather for tomorrow. Is <laughs> I'm more a it's like I go to my manhole, like my manhole, is that right? okay. man cave. Yeah. Yes, let's go. Okay. <laughs> I can I say? Yeah. Cheap, 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 cheap. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's loving this. I am. <laughs> Wait and see. Did you want, you're not having any fish, so don't Come on. Don't say that. It was really important to me that, what? I'm so sorry. That was gold. That was gold. <laughs>